All right, welcome to Hoops Tonight, presented by FanDuel here at The Volume. Happy Thursday, everybody. We have almost made it to the NBA's All-Star Weekend. We are live on AMP, so if you're watching on the YouTube feed or any of our podcast feeds, don't forget that AMP is the very first place that you guys can get these shows. We have a jam-packed show today. The Red Hot Cavs ran into a Red Hot Sixers team, and the Sixers kind of beat their ass, so I have some thoughts on that game. We got to see the new-look Lakers for the first time ever with LeBron and AD and all the pieces they brought in at the trade deadline, and they looked fantastic, so we're going to talk about that as well. Um, then the Bucks and the Celtics played a really weird game on Tuesday night. Uh, that the Bucks ended up winning in OT, despite the Celtics being down four starters. I have some thoughts about that game, but I want to just dive into that particular matchup because I'm incredibly excited and hopeful that we'll see them in the Eastern Conference Finals this year. You guys know the drill. Before we get started, subscribe to the Volumes YouTube channel so you don't miss any more of our videos. Follow me on Twitter at underscore JasonLT so you guys don't miss any show announcements. And if for whatever reason you guys miss one of these shows and you can't get back over to YouTube to finish, remember you can find them wherever you get your podcasts under hoops tonight. And last but not least, you guys have heard me talk about Game Time, the fastest growing ticketing app in the United States. If you're looking to go to an NBA game or an NHL game or a college basketball game, Game Time is the best place to get last minute deals on tickets to all of these. I've been watching today the coverage of Kevin Durant's introductory press conference with the Phoenix Suns. And so there's been a heavy media presence there. And man, they are getting ready to uh, to celebrate that move. I saw they have t-shirts on the chairs for every single seat in the arena tonight welcoming KD. They have a massive uh, banner that's like hanging on the side of the arena over that courtyard that's just outside the arena. Uh, w- I talked a little bit about this last week, but we just have not, uh, here in the state of Arizona, you guys know I'm from Tucson, we have not had a star of that caliber uh, in our neck of the woods in a very long time. I am incredibly excited to get on game time and find tickets to a Suns game here in the next month and get up there and check KD out. Um, you, no matter where you live, get out and have some fun this week. Download the game time app, enter your email, redeem code HOOPS for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. The app is super easy to use. You're going to find a good deal. You're going to know exactly where your seat is at. You're going to have a good feel of what your experience is going to be like. Again, enter your email and code HOOPS. That's H O O. PS for $20 off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. All right, so let's start with Cavs Sixers. So the Cavs were on a seven game winning streak and they went in and just got absolutely smacked by the Sixers. They were down 31 to 10 before you could even see straight. There's a little bit of a fake comeback at the end, but that tends to happen a lot in the NBA. It was more or less a beat down from the start. Now, I wanted to start with the Sixers' defensive scheme because I thought that was a big part of how they uh, really stagnated Cleveland to start this game. They ran a very exaggerated drop coverage with Joel Embiid hawking the paint, and then they were overhelping off of Evan Mobley and Isaac Okoro and more or less just completely ignoring them and conceding wide-open corner threes to them. Um, in that third, uh, In that first quarter, I think of at least four uh, wide open corner threes for Evan Mobley and Isaac Okoro, and they missed every single one of them. And that's what they're going to do this season on completely unguarded threes when the defender is at least six feet away. Evan Mobley is 21% on threes. Isaac Okoro is 34% on three. 34% sounds okay, but again, that's on completely wide open conceded threes. And that just puts Donovan Mitchell and Darius Garland in a really tough spot because, you know, I've talked about this a lot this season with the Lakers because they've had a lot of issues off ball and we've been covering that team a lot. And, you know, I keep saying like people get on LeBron or, or Russ or Anthony Davis for settling for jump shots. But like when the defense is ignoring off ball players and really packing the paint, you kind of only have two options. You can swing to that inferior player who's probably going to miss the shot or you can shoot over the top of the defense. Like you can you can try to get downhill into the paint with actions and different types of things, but it's going to be extremely difficult, labor intensive and difficult to replicate. Especially if the refs allow a lot of contact, which the more bodies are around in there, the harder it is to see things and more contact is going to happen. And, you know, in that first quarter, eventually Darius Garland and, and Donovan Mitchell just started taking tougher shots and they made some. Like Donovan Mitchell made a nasty, you know, kind of pull up three on the right wing after the first timeout when it was 31-10, and Darius Garland hit like a tough fadeaway along the right baseline and hit another three. Like they hit some shots, but nowhere near enough to help them hang in the game. 
And, you know, these offensive limitations, I've been talking about the Cavs in their small forward position forever. Evan Mobley, it's more or less just he's young. Like, I I would imagine that three, four years from now, Evan Mobley is going to be a very reliable perimeter shooter. I just, I trust his work ethic and I I trust the level of ability that he has uh, as a naturally gifted perimeter big. Um, But, you know, guys like Isaac Okora, like that's going to be an issue until they upgrade that position, which is something I've been preaching all season. On the other end of the floor, James Harden was magnificent in this game. Just absolutely schooled Isaac Okoro from the start. They put him in that on-ball role, obviously keeping Mitchell and Garland off-ball, where they're dealing with massive physical mismatches, which is a whole other story. But one of the things that James Harden was doing really good with Isaac Okoro was flipping screen angles and getting him to lean one way or the other. I've talked a lot about this on this show, but like I'm guarding the ball. They're going to come set a ball screen. I can't just key in on James Harden and just slide as he slides. I have to prep for the screen. So like my big man who's behind me, so in this case, Jared Allen or Evan Mobley, probably Jared Allen, he's coming up and he's telling me, screen left, screen right, right? And so I'm not looking backwards, but I have an idea where the screen is coming because the big man is informing me. So if there, if it's an ice coverage, I'm hopping all the way up towards the screen side to force him to reject, but you're not doing that at the top of the floor. You're actually prepping to run over the screen. So what that is, if he, if he says screen left, I'm like kind of peeking over my shoulder. I might have to take my eyes off James Harden temporarily to get a feel. I'm sticking this arm out to try to, uh, to get a little bit of leverage as I'm starting to try to fight. And I'm picking up this left leg to take a big step over the top of the screen so that I can kind of try to wedge myself in between and try to beat James Harden to that spot. So if James Harden times it right to where right as I'm starting to take that step and starting to work over the screen, if he cuts back this way, I'm engaged with the ball screen. I'm engaged with Joel Embiid there. It's going to be really difficult for me to then reverse and fight back the other way. And like, you know, Isaac Okor is a really good athlete and he's got really strong hands. And if he gets physical with me at the point of attack, he's going to be able to have some success there. But if I'm constantly navigating screens and James Harden is keeping distance between us, he's going to have a lot of uh, success getting separation from me. Um, And then when he did get that initial separation, he was taking big escape dribbles. Like, like, uh, you know, when he would get over the screen and Isaac is trailing him, He's pushing out like 20 feet off to the right to really drag the screen defender over so that when Isaac recovers, there's that kickback pass to Joel Embiid or the defense will have to help out of somewhere else if they stay home on Joel Embiid, which is going to open other things in rotation. The bottom line is, is in that first quarter, James was just picking them apart in pick and roll. I think at the uh, first, uh, there was a timeout at about the five minute mark or a stoppage around the five minute mark. And in less than seven minutes to start the game, James Harden had eight points with six assists and zero turnovers. He was awesome in this game. And then towards the end, they started switching. Towards the end of the first quarter, they started switching and they put uh, Evan Mobley directly onto James Harden. And he was barbecuing Evan Mobley just in straight ISO, just killing him with that left to right crossover, getting him to kind of hop over to his right and then uh, bringing it back over to his right hand and getting into the basket and finishing. He only had 19 points and 12 rebounds, but I thought James Harden completely dominated this game. And then outside of that, it's kind of a physical, it's a physical mismatch in general between these two teams. We, we often get swayed by height in the NBA. So we think, oh man, Jared Allen and Evan Mobley, that's two big dudes. But uh, the reality is, is Joel Embiid just sees those guys as two skinny guys that he can bully. And he didn't even have his outside jumper going, and he had 29 and 14 in this game. And, you know, strength, I talk about this a lot on the show, strength is one of the most underrated abilities in the game of basketball. Like, it helps you fight in so many different spots on the floor. Like, for instance, strength helps you win box-out battles. Strength helps you fight for position when you're trying to get to a certain spot so you can run a play right or to fight for post position or to set your man up when you're trying to run off a screen. Strength is a big part of how you leverage guys into those positions. Um, strength driving to the rim. When guys are being physical at the point of attack, you can blow through contact if you have a strength advantage. At the rim, finishing through contact as guys are hitting you. And then obviously on the defensive end, when you're allowed to use your hands a little bit, it helps. Strength was always something that helped me a lot when I was playing in college because I wasn't very skilled when I was in college, so I was playing more of a big, whereas at my older age, I'm like a guard now. But back in college, I was basically a stretch four, and I was a lot stronger than most guys my size. I was like most 6'6 athletes that you see even in the pros are maybe 205 pounds and I was 225 pounds. And so 
like I was hanging with all the big, strong, you know, 6'10 uh, centers and forwards that were in our conferences just because I was stronger than them. And I, and I just used my leverage to get position or to box them out or to fight to spots on the floor and things along those lines. It was a big thing that helped me when I was playing. And so it's, it's just something that I believe very passionately in as a very important basketball skill. Like young basketball players out there, get in the weight room. You know, like you need to balance that with shooting so you don't get overly tight. But in plyometrics, but get in the weight room. It's such an important part of the game of basketball. Um, but, you know, Joel Embiid just absolutely bullied uh, Jared Allen and Evan Mobley in this game, 29 and 14. I also really, really like the dynamic of bringing Tyrese Maxey off the bench. Um, it, obviously, Tyrese Maxey's really good. Uh, there are some nights where he's arguably their second best player, but it's just about the distribution of responsibilities on the floor. Like Tyrese Maxey is so good with the ball in his hands and he's made himself a good off ball threat as well, but he's so good with the ball in his hands that he brings a ton of value to bench groups. So if you start him and he plays even just the first six minutes of the game before he subs out, like it's kind of a waste of what he does, especially if you plan on using him, let's say 32 minutes in a game. Wouldn't you rather have that six minute stretch saved for the end of the first quarter when maybe James Harden goes to the bench? Or I mean the early second quarter when James Harden goes to the bench, like there's just a time when it makes more sense to have him out there. And then if the matchup dictates it, then you can play him in the closing group if he's one of your four best players, which he is, and you need him in that group. But I actually like staggering him and bringing him off the bench. I've been talking about this a lot with the with the Lakers, with Dennis Schroeder. I've always wanted him to come off the bench, but they've been using him as a starter because Darvin Ham trusts him as a point of attack defender. Finally, last night, they moved Dennis Schroeder to the bench, much more natural role, and the starting lineup started cooking because you have a natural off-ball player in that position. So, you know, I, I DeAnthony Melton, for instance, like that that's a guy who can do some stuff with the ball in his hands, but he's an excellent off ball player. And so it gives them just uh, a, a, I actually like that fit a little bit better with Tyrese Maxey coming off the bench. Philly, zooming out a little bit. Um, this is a team that I've had a really good read on this year. Like I again, I always tell you guys when it comes to predictions, like don't ever judge, you know, a basketball uh, talking head or analyst based on predictions because if we could always just predict everything that happens, we'd be down in Vegas making a shit ton of money just betting on games rather than talking about them. You get the point. Uh, but there are teams that I've had a good feel on this year and there are teams that I have not, you know. For instance, Sacramento, I had a bad feel on that team. I did not think they'd be very good, but they're scoring the shit out of the basketball and so they've been pretty good. I've had a really good read on Philly, though. I had a feeling James Harden would have a great season. He's had a great season. We'll talk about that in a minute. And I talked about how in December, I said, if they get, and now that they're getting healthy, I expect them to go on a run in the spring. Well, since December 9th, the Sixers are 26 and 7. That is the best record in the NBA over that span. That's almost half the season. That's 34 games, 33 games. In that span, they're number one in offense, 11th in defense, second in net rating. James Harden has been fantastic. We talked about him earlier in this particular game, but he's averaging 1.1 points per pick and roll in over 700 pick and rolls. He's sixth in the league among 41 players to run at least 500. He's averaging 1.12 points per ISO, which is eighth out of 52 players to run at least 100 ISOs. He's shooting 53% in effective field goal percentage on pull-up jump shots. Um, which is 10th out of 33 players to take at least 300 pull-up jump shots. He looks every bit as good with the eye test as he has been producing on the box score as well. He looks fast. He looks strong. He had a play earlier in this game where he bullied Donovan Mitchell at the rim, just kind of shrugged him off and drew Evan Mobley in help and made a really nice kickout pass. Um, he's getting great lift on his step back three, which is good for him in ISO situations. And like, I look at little things like cooking Evan Mobley in isolation, one of our better bigs in the league that can guard on the perimeter. That's a great sign. You know, I, I predicted before the season that this would be a huge bounce back season for James. And it absolutely has, it has been, he's held up his end of the bargain in that regard. Um, moving on to the Cavs after last night, they are now below 500 against teams that are 500 or better. Uh, we talked about this a lot with the Grizzlies the other day, but they're just like the Grizzlies, but of the Eastern Conference. They're too small in the backcourt. Um, they're also like a little thin on the front line. We talked about that earlier so that they can struggle a little bit with some of the bully ball forwards that we have in the league. And they have nowhere near enough offensive skill beyond their two guards to score in the half court against really good defense. 
Um, so good teams can give them really, can give them a lot of problems on both ends of the floor, which is why they are 15 and 16 against teams that are 500 or better this year. I think they are a prime candidate for a first round exit unless they can draw Brooklyn in that four five matchup. In which case, I'd probably pick Cleveland, but I give Brooklyn a chance there. Like, and I, I wanted to just hit a quick side note on Brooklyn here. Uh, Mikhail Bridges went off for 45 points in a big win over the Miami Heat last night. I said after that trade, like. Just give Mikael Bridges the ball and find out what he can do as a primary initiator. You get to see it for a playoff run here now too. But I'm really curious to see what he's capable of there because he just hasn't quite had enough of that opportunity in Phoenix. Little stretches when guys get hurt, but not like serious, hey, I'm a lead ball handler for a six-month period or for an entire season. So I'm really excited to see what he can do. And that, that's that's what I like about taking uh, chances on guys that are former lottery picks that didn't work with their previous team. Now, Mikhail did work with his previous team, but he worked in a smaller role as like a more of like the Andrew Wiggins role in Golden State, where he's like an aggressive scorer, but more kind of in the flow of the offense. It's not like you're like really running stuff for him all that frequently. Um, the Claxton, Dorian Finney-Smith, Mikhail Bridges defensive trio that we were all super excited to see has now played 102 possessions and has posted a 97 defensive rating, which is outstanding and they are outscoring teams by eight points per 100 possessions with those three on the floor. All right, let's move on to the Pelicans and the Lakers. Last night was the most fun I've had watching a Lakers game in two years. There was a a lot of things that fell into place. Obviously healthy, so there's a lot of talent on the floor. Um, LeBron and Anthony Davis engaged. Not having that clunky Russell Westbrook fit. And then Darvin Ham did – it was almost like I joked with uh, uh, with someone that I work with. I, I joked today that it was almost like Darvin Ham was reading the Twitter feed because it was like everything that all the Laker fans were screaming at ever since the deadline, screaming about ever since the deadline, was exactly who he went with as the starter. He, he flipped – Dennis Schroeder for Malik Beasley so that Dennis Schroeder could run run bench groups and put a natural off-ball player. I think you could have gone with Malik Beasley or Austin Reeves there. They're both really good. And then, knowing that you need Rui Hachimura in the bench group for ball handling and shooting, but that Jared Vanderbilt could take is a better defensive player who can take perimeter defense assignments, it made a lot of sense to move Jared Vanderbilt into that 3 and D role uh, three and D is not the right answer because Jared. Uh, I don't even think Jared's attempted a three since he came to the Lakers. But I should say that primary wing defender role with that starting lineup. And so he went with D'Lo, Malik Beasley, Jared Vanderbilt, LeBron, and Anthony Davis. And so there's two guys that I want to hit on there because they've been going with D'Lo, LeBron, and AD as the foundational kind of piece ever since the trade. Obviously, with LeBron being out, it was a little weird. But Malik and Jared are the two changes, and I wanted to talk a little bit about how that adds synergy to those lineups. So first of all, Malik Beasley is a great spot-up player, even though he's been missing his wide-open three since he came to the Lakers, but he's also a guy that you can run dribble handoff stuff for and off-screen stuff, like wide pin-down stuff for. So like um, when you combine that with D'Angelo Russell, who can also do all of that stuff, D'Lo's always been underappreciated as an off-ball player. It's one of the reasons why I actually don't hate that trade. You know, if you have D'Lo as a primary offensive fulcrum, you're going to be disappointed sometimes. But in a situation like this where they don't need him to be that, um, all of a sudden his skill set becomes super valuable. But with D'Lo and Malik Beasley, when and one of the weird things that happened in this particular game, and I'm not sure if you guys noticed this, but the Lakers ran a lot more in terms of offensive organization. They were coming down and running multiple interchanges on almost every single possession. Like, and uh, now uh, they talked after the game. It wasn't necessarily by design. It was just basketball players playing basketball. They were you know, flowing into stuff. Here's a quick dribble handoff flowing into a ball screen, or here's a wide pin down with Malik chasing off the screen that AD then turns and catches, which then flows into a dribble handoff with LeBron James. They were just running interchanges. And one of the big reasons why they weren't running those interchanges before the trade deadline is you weren't gaining any advantage there. You run sets to gain an advantage. And when all of your off-ball players are guys that you can literally run an off-ball drop coverage on, meaning have AD's man sag all the way back and just have whoever the guard defender is just go underneath the screen, it's it's easy to just shut those actions off. But when you have to chase those guys over the top of the screens, now all of a sudden you're running those dribble handoffs and you're running those wide pin downs and you're getting separation for guys. And you're creating openings 
which are allowing good basketball players to extend that advantage and then get great shots. Having all that real offensive skill around LeBron and AD led to immediate results. In 25 possessions with that starting lineup last night, the Lakers posted a 140 offensive rating. And just in general, like, uh, I like because they looked really good too when they went to their bench and you had guys like, you know, Austin Reeves come in and make plays and Rui Hachimura come in and make plays. And just, you know, when you. I play a lot of pickup basketball these days. Obviously, I'm a former college player who just has that stupid, unrelenting itch to play the game, right? And I know there are a lot of you guys who love to play as well. And, you know, I'm sure that when you go play pickup, there are days where you're playing with guys that don't really know how to play. And it can get discouraging because, like, something will open up and you'll cut back door and the guy who has the ball, like, won't know what to do. So he'll miss you. Or, like... You run up the floor, no one knows how to move without the basketball, or no one knows how to pass and screen away, or any of those things. And so your pickup basketball game just gets really ugly, and it's not fun. And I have days where I leave the gym where I'm just super discouraged, because I'm like, man, I just miss playing real basketball. You know what I mean? Uh, But then there are these days where you play, and like today, I met up with a couple of my buddies who both played in college, and we played together, and like we know how to play basketball. So the ball was moving and popping around and guys were moving and screening and and doing all those different things. And like, there's almost like this, it's almost like a flow that takes place when guys know when to do what they're supposed to do, when to cut versus when to stand still, when to look for their own shot versus when to keep the ball moving, when to, uh, uh, you know, how to angle a ball screen and when, like if you're going to pop to the three point line or to roll to the basket based on where there's openings on the floor, like having that type of offensive IQ and offensive skill just makes offense flow in a certain way. Now imagine at the NBA, it's that same effect times a hundred. You know what I mean? Like, these are – you're going against really good defenses, right? So playing bad offensive basketball or having a lack of offensive skill on the floor can be massively detrimental because you're not playing pickup basketball against a bunch of guys that don't know how to play defense, right? It's, it's even more magnified at that level. So then when you get lineups where you've got a bunch of guys who know how to play together, there's just a, a rhythm and flow to the offense. Like LeBron. LeBron came into that game last night – All season long when he's taken days off and he's come back, he's had to be aggressive because of the lack of offensive skill and his lack of rhythm really shows up there. He'll fumble the basketball around. He'll have a bunch of turnovers. He'll miss a bunch of jump shots. Like last night he went 0 for 5 from 3, but like he played a great game because like he wasn't taking bad shots. Everything was in the flow of the game. You took a bunch of workload off of LeBron So he can ease his way back until he's in rhythm. There are so many advantages that come from having competent basketball players around LeBron James and Anthony Davis. It's something I've been preaching about for literally years at this point. And it was just super refreshing to see last night. Um, Jared Vanderbilt. You know, so when when they made the Rui Hachimura trade, I talked a lot about using Rui to guard the other team's best forward. And I still think they've they've uh, um, done that a handful of times this year, but Rui's not nearly the defensive player that Jared Vanderbilt is. And so putting J- Jared Vanderbilt in that specific position, it helps you in a bunch of different ways. First of all, for a matchup like Brandon Ingram, and Brandon Ingram was awesome last night. Like, he made some tough shots that were heavily contested, perfectly defended. But, like, he shot below 50% for the first time in the month of February last night. And I think a big part of that is, is like, you know, two or three of those ones that he might make end up being misses because Jared Vanderbilt is six foot nine and has a long wingspan and can actually bother Brandon Ingram in a way that Patrick Beverly can't when he rises up over the top to shoot. You know, he's a little bit thinner and a little bit more wiry, much more laterally quick than Rui Hachimura, so he navigates the ball screens and, and off ball screens and things like that much better. And, you know, you you live with those tough shots. Like, there's a version of that night where B.I.'s not that locked in, and instead of going 10 for 21, he goes 5 for 21, and the Lakers win by 35 points. You know what I mean? Like, it was a, a really impressive defensive job from Jared Vanderbilt, making it hard on Brandon Ingram. And I thought it just was a much more natural fit with that starting lineup. Um, but again, just in general, the, the, uh, the aggregate offensive skill really popped off the screen. I wanted, I wanted to read one more stat to you and make one more point. 
So um, coming into last night, the Lakers averaged 25 assists on 43 made field goals per game. That's 58% of their made field goals. Last night, they had 32 assists on 44 made field goals, which is 73% of their made field goals. So again, it just puts them in a situation where they have to take tough shots less often when they can play basketball with real rhythm and flow and get easier shots within the flow of the offense. Last guy I wanted to shout out there was Austin Reeves. He's not a very gifted athlete. Um, he's a bit undersized for his position, right? Not a lights out shooter. Like he's shooting 37% this year from three on pretty high shot quality. Um, but the guy is just an incredible connective piece for any offense. All those things I just talked about, about how to fit with a basketball team. Those that's his speciality. That's what he does better than anybody else in the league. He's, he's like a great a closeout attacker. He's great at making reads. They can even run some primary ball handler actions. There's one play in particular in this game. is like early fourth quarter. Um, CJ McCollum and J- Jonas Valanciunas are guarding, I believe it, uh, it might not have been Jonas, but one of the Pelican centers was guarding LeBron. And they set a ball screen. LeBron's setting the screen. Austin's coming off. And the Pelicans just switch it. And so when they switch it, Austin comes off and he's around the free throw line. And you know, Lonnie Walker might just rise up and take a 15-footer there, but Austin's not really hunting his shot all that often. He only took two shots in the game in like 22 minutes. There's a quick retreat dribble, kind of uh, gathers himself, and LeBron what does what a lot of teams do when things get stagnant. He just cuts to the rim. So just back cuts on CJ McCollum and dusts him, and Austin, because he kept his dribble alive and was paying attention to what was happening around him, was able to hit LeBron in stride with a bounce pass, and he ends up going up to the basket and getting an and one. I, this idea, this whole concept I've been talking about tonight, you guys have probably heard me talk about this before in the past. I refer to it as aggregate offensive skill. But when your aggregate offensive skill rises to a certain level, the game just becomes easier for everyone else. This season, through all the crap, through all the rust stuff, through all the in and out of the lineup stuff, through all of the roster imbalances, if you just put LeBron, Anthony Davis, and Austin Reeves on the floor together, they've played 483 possessions and are outscoring teams by nine points per 100 possessions, excellent on both ends of the floor. Just a great connective piece. Um, I think he's just as good a candidate for that starting two spot as anybody else, especially if Malik can't get his three-point shot going. It's something to keep an eye on. But it was a good win. I mean, I thought the Pelicans threw a great punch. Uh, They played a great game. They made a lot of tough shots, and the Lakers really whooped their ass. And it could have been worse. Like, Malik Beasley missed a bunch of wide-open shots. I think he was two for seven from three in the game. Uh, Mo Bamba got a bunch of of wide open above the break threes and he's shooting almost 50% on above the break threes this year. And he went over five, you know? So like he, uh, th- th- there's a version of this that they can even go up to another level. I think as a team, they shot in the high twenties from three this game. Um, so, but even despite all of that, they completely dominated the game, put up a 100 defensive rating, which is excellent. Um, and you didn't have to wear anybody out. Anthony Davis played the most minutes out of any starter, and he only played 30 minutes and 10 seconds. You know, so for our first look of the fully healthy Lakers with all their new pieces, I thought it went pretty damn well. Um, obviously, just one game, and now they're heading into the All Star break, so they're going to have some time to practice. And they have a really tough stretch of games right after that. I think they play Golden State right away after. Um, there's some tough games coming up, and and you're gonna we're gonna learn a lot more. Uh, uh, pretty quickly here about the Lakers. Uh, one last note on the Lakers before we move on. Uh, I had I caught a little bit of flack yesterday, and th- this ha- is kind of a natural part of the business. Like I did a thirty-minute show with Colin Cowherd, but then a social media clip that's you know fifty seconds long goes out, and it's completely out of context, and then and then everybody freaks out. But one of the things I said, we talked a lot about Anthony Davis with Colin Cowherd. And basically the topic was like, Hey, like what if he breaks down again? You know, because he hasn't looked great since he came back from the injury. There's Intel that he might need foot surgery in the off season. Anyway. Uh, there was another piece of Intel that came out a while back that stated that, uh, Anthony Davis, his particular injury is one that many teams would have shut him down for the season for, which is why he needed to get a second opinion when his first, uh, 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 doctor visit was over. Like, there's a lot of re- there's a lot like Anthony Davis looked fantastic last night. Um, you guys know me. I'm I'm borderline like a, I'm like a hopeless romantic when it comes to the to the Lakers and the LeBron and Anthony Davis ceiling. All you have to do is listen to this show and hear me talking about how I think they can win a championship despite being 27 and 32. You guys know how much I believe in Anthony Davis when he's right. 
But what I said with Colin was I said, like, hey, like, if it goes south again this year, then they might have to consider trading him. And his value might be really low, so they might have to consider using him potentially as a vehicle for the Kyrie Irving trade. Didn't say I want to trade Anthony Davis. Didn't say I wanted to trade him for Kyrie. Just simply said they might have to consider it if he breaks down again. And again, like, Laker fans have this idea, like, oh, we're going to be able to flip Anthony Davis for a star. No, you won't. Not if he ends the season broken down again. That would be three consecutive seasons where he failed to finish the season at an MVP level. What team is going to give away a really good young player or a star and high-end draft compensation if Anthony Davis is three for three and not being available to play at a high level in the playoffs over the last few years? Like, I mean... He hit the Jets and really like messed up the Phoenix Suns twice in a row in the first round of the 2021 playoffs and then broke down. I'm a huge believer in Anthony Davis' ceiling, but if he can't be there for the next four months, what's the point? It's like with Zion Williamson. Like, there's intel that he re-aggravated his hamstring injury and he's going to be out, you know, probably another month or so or more. Like, if he can't return and be in peak shape for the playoffs and then it happens again next year, at what point do you go, okay, that's three seasons in a row where he's just not available and he's young, like he should be ready. Anthony Davis is 29. Like this is when he should be. It's not going to like suddenly get better when he's in his early 30s. Now to be clear, I'm rooting for Anthony Davis to get back to form. And last night, he was amazing. Arguably the best player on the floor. But if he, they need him to be that all the way through June. And, it, and if he breaks down or can't play at that level, then guess what? He doesn't have a lot of value around the league. And again, I'm not upset about it because it's just kind of, this is, one of the things you'll learn about this business is people take stuff out of context all the time. It's kind of just part of the deal. But when it comes to Anthony Davis, I want him to stay a Laker. I want him to play like a superstar. If he does, hell no, you're not trading him this summer. You're keeping him and you're running it back with this group next year. That's what I want. I don't want to trade AD. But if he breaks down again, then at a certain point, like you've got to, like, how can you plan for the future of your franchise if Anthony Davis is unavailable for you? I pointed out this stat yesterday, and it's, it blows my mind. Jason Tatum played in 100 NBA games last year. Since the bubble, Anthony Davis has played in 116. That's over three seasons. And they're 58 and 58. Because for a lot of those 116 games, he hasn't looked like Anthony Davis. There's kind of a recurring theme. It's like he gets hurt. And then when he comes back, there's like another month where he's not great. And then maybe if, if, if he can stay on the floor long enough, he'll click into rhythm and then you'll get that ceiling. And then you're just hanging on for dear life, hoping he doesn't get hurt again. I'm as big a fan and a believer in the LeBron and Anthony Davis ceiling as you'll find. But the unfortunate reality is last night has been an exception. Not the reality of the Anthony Davis experience over the last three years. And when you set those emotions aside and you look at the situation, you might have to make that move. If he does get hurt, you take a look at the landscape. You start making calls. If you can get something great, then great. But if you can't get something great, if teams are like, eh, two first round picks and, you know, maybe a rotation player or two. At what point do you just say like, okay, I'd rather have Kyrie Irving, you know, that's what I meant. And when it comes to Anthony Davis, I do think there's a disconnect for Laker fans between what his actual value is around the league as an injury prone player versus what Lakers fans value him as when it goes to his ceiling, which again, we all, we all are fans of Anthony Davis when he's at his ceiling. All right, before we get out of here, let's talk some Bucks Celtics. So they play on Thursday night. I, I didn't cover the game because four Celtic starters were missing. You got you guys know me. Like I'm I uh, I'm 
really looking through everything through the playoff lens. Um, I think that playoff basketball is so different from regular season basketball. And even when I'm watching regular season games, I'm kind of just trying to pick up little things that I think will translate to the playoffs so that I can help, you know, so that it can help when we're uh, covering the teams in the playoffs. Um, but I did watch some of the game. I watched most of the end of it. The Celtics played really well. They're a deep team. They have a lot of talent when you get past those four guys who were out. And so the Bucks had to really grind out a overtime win, largely on the strength of Drew Holiday making a lot of threes at the end of the game. Um, but what I'd rather do today is I'd rather uh, like back out a little bit and just talk about both of these teams in the big picture and talk a little bit about what their matchup will look like in the fi- uh, Eastern Conference Finals if they get there. So first of all, with the Celtics, I think they have the higher ceiling, no question. I think they, I think they had the most talented roster in the league last year. And both Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown have both gotten a little bit better. Um, the Malcolm Brogdon trade was literally the perfect piece to improve their ball handling situation. Derek White's playing some of the best basketball of his career. Over his last 11 games, he's averaging 20 points per game. Um, averaging over seven three-point attempts per game, shooting 43% on those. He torched the Memphis Grizzlies the other night just by beating people off the dribble. You know, they, they're, they're, this team is freaking insanely good. Robert Williams will be much healthier in this playoff run. He was on a bulky, a bulky knee last year. Looking at the Bucks, they're also really good. 111 in a row. Giannis is averaging 37, 13, and 6 in that span. I saw the Tim Bontemps uh, straw poll come out today, and uh, Jokic looks like he's running away with MVP. Now, this is not a Jokic take, because I think Jokic is a deserving MVP candidate. But, like, Giannis has clearly reached the point, that LeBron point, where people are just numb to his winning impact. Like, this is, this is Giannis's MVP case. The Bucs have a higher winning percentage than Denver this year despite having a lesser roster, in my opinion, especially with Chris Middleton being mostly unavailable and Drew Holiday being in and out of the lineup. For the season, he's averaging 33, 12, and 6, and he's a much, much better defensive player than Nikola Jokic. I think he's by far the best player in the world. So in my opinion, if you're doing an MVP breakdown, like it's Giannis and Jokic together, and Embiid's pretty damn close too. The idea that Jokic is just head and shoulders above these guys, which again, that train is full speed ahead and there's nowhere near enough time left to knock that train off the tracks. Like Nikola Jokic is going to win MVP. He's a heavy favorite on FanDuel and Tim Bontep's, uh, his uh, uh, straw pool poll is like gospel when it comes to the MVP pick. Uh, but I just don't, I, I don't necessarily think it's fair. And, and I think a big part of it is a good chunk of MVP voters lean heavily on catch all metrics, which is something that I passionately disagree with. Um, and those kinds of things are just not going to favor a guy like Joel Embiid nearly as much. And they haven't favored Giannis in this particular season in large part in, because I think the Eastern Conference is a little bit tougher and his percentages have gone down because of the fact that he's been down all of his spot up guys all season. So I don't think Giannis should win, but I think he should absolutely have a chance. And I, to be honest with you, if the Bucs finish with a better record, I would give the award to Giannis. A um, couple of other notes on the Bucs. The trio of Giannis with Drew Holiday and Joe Ingles is plus 13 net in 307 possessions so far this year. Throw in Chris Middleton and they're plus 17 net in 54 possessions. So that's a great example of what I've been talking about, which is get real spot-up talent, real offensive skill, around Giannis, and that makes them completely unstoppable on offense. As for the matchup between the Bucs and the Celtics, um, potentially in the conference finals, what I, like, we, we know a lot of things from last year. For instance, we know Giannis is going to go Super Saiyan and just try to bully his way to the basket every time down. That's literally what he did last year. We also know that Boston is probably going to guard him with a steady diet of Al Horford and Grant Williams. And those guys do, did a pretty decent job on him last year. Then on the other end of the floor, uh, the Bucs are going to keep Brooke Lopez right under the rim and concede open threes probably to uh, Al Horford or, or leave um, Robert Williams unguarded in the dunker spot. And they are going to try to force Boston to make good reads and drive and kick. And if Boston drives in and tries to finish over Brooke Lopez all the time, they're going to miss a lot of shots. They're going to fall down and complain at the refs and the Bucs are going to beat them down the floor and transition all game long. But if they drive and kick, they're going to get a boatload of really good threes and they're probably going to win. 
So this game is this particular series will come heavily down to execution. You know, Boston has to take care of the basketball and get good shots, or Giannis is going to get out in transition and just murder them. Um, I remember last year during that series, if you looked at the dynamics, like Boston was a much better half court offense than Milwaukee was. But Milwaukee just destroyed Boston in transition, and that's how they pushed that series to seven games. Um, we also have to factor in the Chris Middleton shot-making element that wasn't there last year in his ability to hit the shots over smaller defensive players. We have to factor in Joe Ingles as a real second-side creator and a better spot-up threat. Like, It's going to be fun. And again, it's not guaranteed. I think that uh, I think that Philly has a decent chance to beat one of these teams in the second round. Um, fighting for that one seed suddenly becomes super important because you'd much rather face Cleveland in the second round than you would face Philly. So look for a real race between Boston and Milwaukee here down the stretch to face for that one seed. But I'm hoping that we get that in the conference finals because that is just going to be a super interesting matchup between two very different styles, two really, really good teams um, but at this particular moment in time, after everything I've seen this season, I still lean ever so slightly towards Milwaukee, mainly just because I don't trust Boston still on the biggest stages to execute properly. Um, in their big games this year, I've still seen them struggle just a little bit. And then obviously that was a huge problem for them in the playoffs last year. All right, guys, that is all I have for today. And all I have for the rest of this weekend, we might have one bonus video coming out on the, um, LeBron passing Kareem uh, in the uh, all-time scoring record. We might have a video coming out about that tomorrow. I'm not 100% sure if that's still on target. But uh, we'll probably have something on Monday morning, breaking down a little bit of the All-Star weekend. And then we're going to um, do one last like kind of like zoom out contender tiers thing. And then we're going to have a video with Carson where we break down the top tier uh, draft prospects in this year's NBA draft. Um, but looking forward to taking a little bit of a break here. It's been one hell of a sprint over the last couple of weeks. So I'm going to enjoy this time off as always. I sincerely appreciate your guys' support and I'll see you on Monday.